Well, here we are. We're at the end of our Roman series, but we're actually at the beginning of Romans. We've been reading Romans backwards, and the point of this was to try to get our minds wrapped around exactly who is Paul talking to when he dives into some of these really thorny and deep and intense and convoluted sometimes theological arguments. So I hope that reading Romans backwards has helped give the context, these two groups in Rome vying for power, struggling for the advantage that we've been reading about so much so far. And I hope that this has just helped you get an idea for the humanness that is attached to this letter that Paul originally wrote to this small group of Christians in Rome. We're going to be in Romans chapter 4 near the start of this letter as we wrap up our study today. And we want to think about this idea of resiliency and how we can truly, in Tempe, Arizona, be Christians who live out a resilient faith. So in Romans chapter 4, Paul's going to say things like this. What does the scripture say? Abraham had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That is a powerful statement. So as you're opening up your Bibles to Romans chapter 4, I want you to be thinking of your word. What I mean by that is, what is your word to describe 2020? It's been an interesting year, to say the least. A lot has gone on. I've seen a lot of jokes about God packing about a decade's worth of history into one year. And that just certainly feels like that's the case, right? There's every day a new headline of something almost unbelievable happening. And it gets more and more unbelievable that it could all happen in such a small amount of time. Well, here we are, people of faith, people who long to be like Jesus in the world. And we wonder, how can we be resilient believers in this odd and frustrating and trying time. And so I asked some of you, what is your word for 2020? And I got some great responses. Uh, Opportunistic was one, frustrating, disappointing, words like that. One person said great. They were trying to be very optimistic, I suppose. Uh, So it's been interesting to see the different words coming in from you. Thank you for sharing. One person said challenging. That seems to be a very fitting word. The word that a friend of mine gave to me recently was the word tumultuous. And I love that word. It just, it's fun to say. It's got four U's in it, which is kind of unique for words. I don't know if that gets you much in a Scrabble score or not, but it's just an interesting word, tumultuous. It kind of brings to mind this riotous feeling, uh, this idea that things are out of place. Things aren't quite settled. Things are loud. Things are noisy. Things are riotous. Things are uh, pressing in. Tumultuous. There's upheaval with this word. And that, to me, seems like a very fitting word for 2020. They say that people are like rubber bands. You can stretch them. People are amazing. People are flexible. They'll go with the flow. They'll roll with the punches. But like a rubber band, every once in a while, you've got to release that tension. We'll stretch a long way, but you've got to give us a break once in a while or else we snap. And so I want us to be thinking about the society that we live in right now, the stress that we see all around us, the polarization that just grows every day, it feels like, and how we as Christians, we bring this tension with us into church. We feel this. We're not immune from the stress of life. Maybe your word for 2020 has been something like hopelessness, weariness, fatigue. And we wonder, where is the resilience that we've been talking about? Can it really be found by studying this ancient letter, by thinking about this man Jesus who lived so long ago and some days maybe feels so distant from us? My dad had a comic on his desk that I remember growing up, and it went something like this. It says, I've been trying to take it one day at a time, but lately it feels like a lot of them have ganged up on me all at once. And that may be how you're feeling today. How are we supposed to progress? How are we supposed to get any kind of traction? How are we supposed to move forward when it feels like one step forward and three steps backwards. We are the church, and we wonder, what is our advantage? Is there really any advantage to being a believer? We're so weary. We're so tired of the fractious nature of life. We're tired of even Christians being people who often let us down with their boasting and posturing and their opinions so loudly flaunted because they're so sure they're right. Well, I say all that to say that I know this church in Rome knew this stress that we know as well. Many of them had this great sense of homelessness, of being displaced, of not really having a place that was their own. 
Whether they were a Jew or a Greek, that would have been more and more the norm as they lived into this life of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. They were facing incredible loss of social standing, of bonds of relationship formed over a lifetime, and they've given that up in many ways to follow this man, Jesus, because he holds up a different kind of life. And I want us to really wrap our minds around and appreciate the really brutal norms that these Christians would have lived through. One of the Caesars had a parade through the streets of Rome. He had people holding banners and and plaques, and they walked ahead of this parade and alongside it, and they shouted to the crowds and drew their attention to these plaques that read something like this, I have killed one million Gauls. I have killed a million people, and they're boasting and they're proud. This is a victory march. And I have enslaved, the plaque goes on, I have enslaved a million more. What a great day for Rome. Not such a great day if you're from Gaul, apparently, where, even if they're exaggerating, a million people dead, your friends, your loved ones. This is the peace of Rome. If you were one of the lucky few, you're now living as a slave. The entire economy of Rome was built on slavery. Rome didn't function without cheap slave labor. It was a systematic exploitation, and Rome is proud. This is how you rule the world, and it's good to be a Roman. There was also a sexual economy where those of privilege, mostly males at the upper echelon of Roman society, could take advantage of any person they wanted, male, female, didn't matter, and abuse them sexually any way they wanted. And these people who are abused have no recourse. This is the day-to-day struggle of people in Rome. And I bring this up because many of the people who are being written to in this Roman letter would have themselves been slaves. This is a culture of dominance and being dominated. And the people who would have read this letter, who are struggling together within their own church, this early church, trying to be born into the world, trying to to do something new that's never been done before with this mixture of people brought together in faith in Jesus, They feel this struggle, and they are fighting with one another over the advantage. That's the question that Paul is addressing to, especially the Jewish believers in the first few chapters of Romans. What advantage do we have for carrying the law for so long, only to let these pagans come alongside us, and now they, it seems, get to rule over us? Even in the church? We've had enough of it in our culture. Why is it allowed in the church? Where was that promise of no more slave or free, or Jew, or Greek. Where did that go, Paul? Where is my advantage? In fact, if we just got our way, we think the world would be a whole lot better. So Paul speaks into this. He speaks into this stress. He speaks into this turmoil in this young church that if they don't get things together, it's just not going to make it. And he speaks into this church and into this stress by telling a really old story of a pretty old man. He tells the story in Romans chapter 4 and reminds these people of the promise to Abram, whose name is later changed to Abraham. He reminds them of this promise of God. I think Paul thinks this story is particularly appropriate because this, for a beleaguered church, offers hope. Here is the story of an old man who must be, by this time, the epitome of tired and weary He has lived as a constant traveler all throughout his life, as God has called him out of a place of comfort into a place that he does not know. He's a stranger in this land, and he's constantly picking up his tent and moving somewhere new. God has made a promise, you will be the father of many nations. And yet Abraham doesn't even yet have a son, at least not the son of promise. And every once in a while, God will show up, And he'll remind him of the promise as Abraham slowly gets older, as his wife, Sarah, slowly gets older, as the hope of something coming from these two people just becomes less and less likely, becomes more of a hope against hope day by day. And yet God shows up every once in a while and he says, Abraham, I want you to look up at the stars. Do you see those? Can you count them? These will be the number of your descendants. Abraham believes. He says, can you count the sand on the seashore? Your descendants will be like this. 
For some reason, Abraham believes. And then a very beautiful picture of God fulfilling this promise. Because as Abraham believes, he also has this question of how that many of us would carry with us, I'm sure. And he says, God, yes, I believe, but maybe this way, maybe this way. And God says, no, 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 you will have a son. And your ancestors, your descendants, rather, would be like this. And as he's getting older, God meets Abraham and he says, let me prove to you how serious I am about this. And he has Abraham lay out all of these animals and he cuts them in half. It's a very bloody and laborious task. And you lay the halves side by side. And the point is that in these days there would be a covenant made, an agreement made, and the two parties who make the agreement would walk through these halved animals together. With a very dramatic picture being that if you break your promise, this is what should be done to you. And so as Abraham does his part, and he splits the animals, and he does the work, and he fends off all of the scavengers that try to show up, drawn to the scene of blood and gore. He waits, and he waits, and again, God doesn't quite show up on time, and Abraham falls asleep. Well, as night approaches, God finally shows up as a burning torch, as a flaming, smoking pot. And God alone, as Abraham sleeps, passes through between the animals, making this beautiful symbolic statement that, Abraham, this does not depend on you. I am co-signing for both of us. I will bring this about because I, the Lord God, have promised. Abraham believes God, and it is credited to him, credited to him as the very character of God, as righteousness, as everything that is good and beautiful and true. God says, this is how I see you, Abraham, because you believe that I will do what I say. And I wonder as we think about this, about days where we struggle for hope, if we have faith like Abraham's, how do we break the gravitational pull of all of these ills around us in society? Something happens, I think, with Abraham because he takes God seriously. And there's got to be something about us as Christians where we are taking God more seriously than anyone else in the world. God moves slowly, doesn't he? His work It's so often subtle. Sometimes it feels like it's even hidden, too small to notice from day to day, which is a difficult process to trust in real time. Moment by moment, trust faith in God that he will do what he says he will do. We want movement. We get impatient. We are taking life seriously. We're seriously hurting today. God, what will you do today? And yet I think if we zoom out a little bit, we can appreciate what a beautiful faith it is that Abraham models for us. Consider that right now in the world, just living today, there are about 2.5 billion Christians alive and serving God. At least 2.5 billion people in the world who say, we choose Jesus because so long ago, Abraham chose God. If you want to extend that a little bit further, there's about 1.8 billion Muslims alive in the world. These people also say, yes, we know Abraham. He had faith. We want to know what it means to have faith like that too. There's another 14 million Jews alive today who owe their ancestry and their faith and their practices to this man, Abraham. That's a huge, incredible amount of people because one man so long ago old, past his prime, had the faith to impact the world. And the thing is, he never got to see that come to fruition. And yet, he kept faith. Consider how seriously Paul took Rabbi Jesus as he takes this message of hope and salvation for the people of God, and he expands this message to include the Gentiles. He carries it with him to places no respectable Jew would ever go to people no respectable Jew would ever interact with. And Paul says, you too can be a child of Abraham if you live by faith. Romans 4, 20 through 22 says something like this. Without losing faith, beginning in verse 19, Abraham, who was nearly 100 years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was also as good as dead. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise. 
He grew strong in faith. He gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. And therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul picks up this faith and he runs with it to places that Jews had not yet imagined. And he takes this message of no more rich and poor, no more slave and free, no more male and female, no more Jew and Gentile. And he does this beautiful experiment with the Jesus story. And he creates these multi-ethnic churches and says, now go and live this life together. <clears throat> this has never before been seen in society. And what makes this all the more incredible, this work that Paul does, is he doesn't have a publisher's deal. He doesn't have a Twitter account. He doesn't have a large platform. He has the gospel of Jesus Christ and the hope that it brings, and he hands out this hope as freely as he can. There's a historian named Tom Holland who's actually an atheist, but he's been very impressed by the impact that Jesus has had on the world in shaping the very best of Western thought and morals. And he says, we owe this to a person named Paul, who without a publisher's deal or any platform to speak from, wrote letters. And we read these letters still today, and they shape our policies, our values. They shape the very best of what we have in our culture today. It's inescapable whether you believe in Jesus or not. Paul, telling the Jesus story, this hopeful story, has reshaped the world in a way that can't be undone. Human rights, freedoms, everything we hold dear, this is Jesus via Paul handed to us through the years of people saying, here is something serious worth handling and worth living out. Archimedes, an ancient Greek scientist, once said, if you give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, I will move the world. Consider this, that the love of God on the cross is that lever and that the grace extended by Jesus Christ is that fulcrum. The world has moved because of a promise God made, and because of all of the people from Abraham till now who have taken that promise seriously. We are that lever and fulcrum, trusting in the promise of God, that no matter how disappointing a year may be, no matter how frustrating, no matter how deadly, there is still hope. And we wonder, well, how do we ever move the world along? We just seem to be spiraling. And we have to remember that we ourselves must first be moved to live a life like Jesus, to take Jesus' promise of peace seriously, to live that promise, to extend it to those around us, no matter how they're treating us, just as Jesus, in turn, responded in peace to those who were aggressively trying to manipulate and kill him. And so we have to think very big and at the same time very small about this promise. Because it's always bigger than we expect, it is beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And yet it also is so small that it impacts just me, just now, whatever's right in front of me. Sometimes we have a hard time realizing what's my responsibility and what isn't. How do I join in what God has asked me to do? How do we as a church join in what God is asking us to do and not more and not less? That's a difficult question to answer. And yet so often we live up here in this sphere of the big, the large promise, and we don't see it happening, at least not immediately. And it's beyond our ability to do much about that, and so we lose hope quickly, forgetting that these moments lived day by day by so many people of, pray, of hope, of promise, of faith. Those moments added up together go a long way in moving us towards God's goal for this world of reconciliation, of people who shouldn't be in the same room together, coming together in the name of Jesus and peace. Consider how apparently Paul's story of Abraham, a very old man, a long, long time before these people in Rome even lived, how inspirational this must have been for them. I say that because here we are today, people who still believe, who hold up Abraham as a person whose faith is to be modeled we want the righteousness of God credited to us. So we must be like Abraham, to take God seriously and to join him in his work. Here we are, so far removed from the dominance of Rome. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, believers in Rome, those first early adapters who said, we see the beauty of Jesus.
and we run towards that, even in the midst of strife. Think how far our culture has come since the days of Rome. And yet we know it's still a long way to peace. The ways of power and privilege are still so pernicious, they sneak into our churches. As we grasp and struggle, try to wrench the advantage from the other. And yet even still, we see the grace that is so prevalent, the truth that can be so persistent, where there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not for us and not from us. We do not condemn. This is our resilience. These many examples of faith that have gone before, that have lived this difficult life, God does not shy away from taking the world very seriously. He takes it deathly serious, as is exemplified with his son on the cross. So what is your word of the year, Tempe Church? Those who would believe, what is your word of the year? Is it something like God's final word that is peace? Is it resilience, knowing that no matter how little movement we tend to see day to day, we know in the long run, incredible things have happened when people take God seriously and at his word. When the word is made flesh in Jesus Christ, when we take that seriously and we embody Jesus out into the world and he is born again day by day, through our actions, through our belief, through how seriously we try to live our faith and take the promise of God, through the peace that we extend, through the grace that we offer, through the mercy that we hand out so freely so that people would know that the promise is for them too. May the grace and peace of God be with us, Tempe Church, as we walk through difficult times together. We don't deny that they're there. We look them straight in the eye. But we are people of faith. We are people of promise. We are people who have a word from God. And the word is peace. The word is hope. The word is resilience. The word is Jesus. May you live the word that is Jesus in your life today. And may his presence be very evident as you walk by faith, holding on to the promise that is for you and for all people. Be blessed, Tempe Church. I love you. And may we continue to live this life of faith together.